but forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. As Mary considered this child, there was to be no ambiguity, no speculation. This child conceived in the womb of this young virgin Mary through the mysterious work of the Holy Spirit was to be understood as that son that God had promised to David and through whom the kingdom of God would be established. It was a promise that had lain dormant almost for a thousand years. When David had established his holy capital in Jerusalem and had resolved to build a temple for God on Mount Zion, God had come to him with the promise that David would bear a son, and in this son all of the covenant promises would be fulfilled. We read it in First Chronicles verse, uh, chapter 17, verse 11, when God says to David, when your days are fulfilled to walk with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. I will not take my steadfast love from him as I took it from him who was before you, but I will confirm him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. It was a glorious promise. Israel had demanded a king in a moment of tremendous faithlessness and rebellion. The prolonged downward spiral in the period of the judges concluded, you remember, with that faithful, fateful statement in Judges 21, verse 25, in those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. It was, of course, not true. God was their king. Yahweh, Jehovah, was their king, their glorious Redeemer King, who had single-handedly come and rescued them from their captivity in Egypt, who had led them and sustained them in their wanderings through the wilderness, and who had established them in the promised land, that good land that He had promised to them, a land flowing, as it were, with milk and honey. There was a king in Israel, and Yahweh was His name. But in their sin and their rebellion, they had turned away from him. And they had turned in on themselves. And they had decided that they would be the arbiters of right and wrong. That they would be the masters of their destinies and the captains of their own fate. And in their hubris, they had come to Samuel, the last of the judges. And they had demanded that they be given a human king. Do you remember at 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4, all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. This demand for a human king. You understand it was a horrific act of ingratitude and idolatry. You hear that, that crucial phrase in there, more than anything else, they wanted to be like all the nations. It was so far from whom God had called them to be. But you remember my favorite passage in Scripture, Exodus 19. As God brings His people out of Egypt through the Red Sea, He stops them in the wilderness. And before they go any further, He says, this is how you are to conceive of yourselves, Israel. You are my treasured possession amongst all of the peoples. On all the face of the earth, Israel, you are unique and distinct from all the other nations because you are mine. You have an intimate union and communion with the living God in a way that others do not. In fact, you, Israel, you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation in the earth. 
They were called to be a light shining into the darkness of this fallen world. They were to be a light shining into the darkness of this fallen world, proclaiming the supremacy of life lived in joyful union with and independence upon the living God. But by the days of Samuel, they had fallen so far from this exalted calling. And all that they wanted to be was, well, to be like everyone else. They weren't interested in being Yahweh's treasured possession anymore. They didn't want to be a holy nation distinct and separate from all the nations of the world. In their hearts, all they wanted was to be like everyone else. And so they demanded that they be given a king. It was a sorrowful moment. As God said to Samuel, O Samuel, it is not you that they are rejecting. They have rejected me from being king over them. But in the promise that God made to David, it became evident that, as is so often true in Scripture and in the life of the church, what arose from evil was redeemed by God to the point that it would be the venue in which His glory would be displayed. The heir of David, a king over Israel, a king who has his roots in this faithless demand, would be the focal point of salvation, the focal point of of embodied security for the people of God, that there would be the son of David sent by God with the dignity and privileges and power of being called his son. And this king Well, he would sit on a throne that would last forever. And he would rule over a kingdom in which all of his enemies and all of the enemies of his people would be subdued. From the horror of Israel's demand for a king grew this promise that there would be a king descended from David who would be the singular guardian of the people of God. It was a promise given to David, but which had its roots, of course, in the promise that God had made to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. You remember in the midst of the curse upon the serpent, God had promised that a son would be born to Adam and Eve who would crush the head of evil under his feet. But as we read through Scripture from that moment onwards, it only ever seemed like evil was was gaining even ever greater power. Hard on the heels of that promise came the murder of Abel by his own brother Cain, that fratricide demonstrating the deep twistedness of the sin that had now entered into the world. And from there we read chapter upon chapter of evil seeming to spread over the face of the earth that God had called good in Genesis 1, until in Genesis 6 we read those heartbreaking words that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. And then that flood came as God's judgment, a a baptism, as Peter calls it in 1 Peter 3, falling on the earth, the wicked immersed by that judgment, and Noah and his family sprinkled by that rain and saved through it. But even after the new start, as Noah appeared out of the ark as a kind of new Adam, commissioned with the same commission that God had given to Adam, Any hopes that we had that the story might be different were quickly dashed. As the story quickly started up again of immorality and violence and jealousy and hatred and faithlessness and adultery and idolatry. And as we read it all, our hearts cry out, where is this Savior? Evil only ever seeming to get stronger. The wicked only ever seeming to get bolder. Even after the kingdom moves from Saul to David, and things seem to be getting brighter, Israel is still plagued by the foreign nations. And even under Solomon, who first appeared to be that son promised in 1 Chronicles 17, while there was peace and prosperity, evil crept in like carbon monoxide 
through the imported gods of Solomon's wives. And we know, of course, from our studies in Isaiah, how that went on to precipitate into the increasing compromise and synchronism that would lead to the exile. Throughout redemptive history, the story has been one of the wicked raging against God and against the people of God. It's the story encapsulated in this psalm, isn't it? Now, Psalm 2 has no superscription above it, no title given to the psalm here. But in Acts chapter 4, verse 24, Peter and John attribute it to David. Many have seen this as a song written by David to be sung at the coronation of those who came after him. A song to be sung as the new king of Israel is crowned. A song that acknowledges that in this fallen world there are many who want to simply get rid of the shackles of God and his law. Many who simply see him as a threat to their freedom, who see his law as a hostile restriction and not a source of blessing. But as the song continues, it says to the people of God that though there are many threats, though evil does indeed seem to be getting stronger and the wicked ever more powerful, this song reassures the people of God that there's nothing to fear because the God who sits in heaven, the God against whom they rage, is not threatened by their wickedness, but rather he sits in heaven and he laughs at them. Commenting on this, Charles Spurgeon wrote in his Treasury of David, mark the quiet dignity of the omnipotent one and the contempt which he pours upon the princes and their raging people. He has not taken the trouble to rise up and do battle with them. He despises them. He knows how absurd, how irrational, how futile are their attempts against him, and therefore he laughs at them. For all their saber-rattling, for all the threatening and the posturing, God knows that he is unopposable in his purposes. And he knows that he has appointed a king who will bring judgment to fall on the enemies of God and his people. He knows that he has appointed a son of David who will receive the whole world as his inheritance. And who will crush the wicked like a piece of pottery struck with an iron bar. The song celebrates the unstoppable power of God, which is terrifying for his enemies, but wholly reassuring for his own people. A song that says to us in the midst of the hardships and the threats and the sorrows of life in a fallen world, as bad as things can seem, as hopeless as things can seem, the promises of God will always hold true, and what he had promised to David he will surely do. That kingdom will be established forever, and the enemies of God and his people will be subdued. The problem, of course, was that with each successive descendant of David, first with Solomon, then with Rehoboam, and then with the litany of kings that followed, which each, with each of them, this promise fell flat. If this was indeed sung at their coronations, we can imagine how the crowd assembled, hearing the voices of the choir, their hearts filled with eager expectation. Right? We don't know exactly how to imagine their coronations, but I'm sure you have seen the, the reels of Queen Elizabeth's coronation, and you've heard of the plans for King Charles, and we can put something together in our minds, and we can imagine this king being crowned, and the choirs lifting up their voices around him, and all in the congregation wondering, is this the man that God had promised? Isn't that one of the themes of Scripture? Just that always wondering, is this the man? And we don't have time to go through it all, but you can imagine Eve holding Cain in her arms. Oh, is this the son? Is this the son that's going to crush evil under his foot? Only then to have her heart broken as Cain murders Abel. We can imagine her then holding Seth in her arms. Maybe this is him. Maybe this is the boy. We can imagine it. All the way through, we can imagine Abraham holding Ishmael and then holding Isaac. 
You could imagine David being crowned and then holding Solomon in his arms. Is this the boy? Is this the man? And then with each successive king, the, the wandering of the congregation, is this the one that God had promised? But of course, none of them were. And with every king crowned after David, that expectation falling flat, this, this psalm being sung and then remaining unfulfilled. But as Gabriel declared to Mary in that child growing in her womb, in that fetus, maybe even just in that, in that embryo, who knows how early on in the pregnancy this angel appeared. Maybe in that embryo growing undetectably yet in her womb, here was this promised king, Gabriel says. Now he declares is the time for that promise to be fulfilled. He will be great, Gabriel says, and he will be called the son of the most high. That's Psalm 2, isn't it? And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. That's Psalm 2. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. That's Psalm 2. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Gabriel quotes the promises made to David. There was to be no speculation for Mary or for anyone who came after him. There was to be no wondering for, for her like there was for the rest of the disciples. You remember Jesus asks the twelve, who do people say that I am? And, and they ping pong all over the place. Maybe a prophet, maybe John the Baptist. Maybe Elijah. But there is to be no wondering in Mary. Right at the beginning, here is who your son is, Mary. He's First Chronicles 17. He's the son of David. He is the man long promised, long awaited. Now come into the world. Come to establish that promised kingdom and to give his people peace. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. That's what this whole season is about, the entrance of this glorious king into the world and the fulfillment of these wonderful promises. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our sins and from our fears and sins. Release us, let us find our rest in thee. Born thy people to deliver. Born a child and yet a king. Born to reign in us forever. Now thy gracious kingdom bring. That's the song of Advent. When Jesus Christ came into the world, he came to fulfill these promises. It's what the angel not only said to Mary, but it's what the angels revealed to the shepherds, wasn't it? In Luke 2. What did the angels declare to them? Fear not, for I behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ. A, a word that simply means the anointed one, like the Son is anointed and Psalm 2, verse 2, there is born in the city of David the anointed one, the Lord. To the shepherds, this cry went out here in this baby is the king who has come to save his people, to defend them against all and any who would do them harm, and who has come to destroy the powers of evil, who has come to establish a kingdom of equity and peace. As John the Baptist and then Jesus himself would preach in Matthew 3 and 4, in the arrival of Jesus, the kingdom of heaven was now at hand. And what now? Well, as David says in Psalm 2, verse 12, Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. As Derek Kidner has put it, this psalm ends on that somber but joyful note that there is no refuge from this son. There is only refuge in this son. As John the Baptist and Jesus preached, not only is the kingdom of heaven at hand in his arrival, but rather repent. 
the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Don't get fooled by the little nativity scenes and the idea of gentle Jesus, meek and mild. But when Jesus entered into the world, he did so as this psalm to you, son, and any and all who rebel against him and against the laws of God will face his terrifying judgment. There is no refuge from him, but there is refuge in him. There is grace for those who cast themselves upon the mercy of this king, for those who flee to him for salvation. There is mercy for any and all against whom his wrath is kindled, if only they come to him in faith and repentance. The psalm does not flinch. To the people of God, the arrival of this king is absolutely wonderful. The destruction of their enemies and the arrival of this king is absolutely wonderful. The security embodied in him for the people of God is absolutely wonderful. But you understand to his enemies... His arrival is absolutely terrifying. But the good news of the gospel is that anyone and everyone can come into his kingdom. If only they lay down their weapons of war, if only they give up their rebellion, if only they come and they kiss the Son and do homage to him and give him the glory that he alone is due. What's so good about Christmas? It is that great David's greater son has come into the world. It is that the promises of God have been kept. It is that the forces of evil have been overcome. It is that the people of God have been secured and put at peace now and forevermore. It is what we sing. Hark, the herald angels sing glory to this newborn king. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we give you thanks for the arrival of our King Jesus. Lord, we give you thanks for all the promises of this long-expected Jesus, but we thank you that what a faithful men of old long to see, we have now beheld in Jesus, the Son of David, come into the world to rule over his glorious kingdom. Oh, Father, as we continue on in this Advent season, we pray that you would truly fan the flames of our hearts into a roaring fire as we consider the enormity of the Incarnation. Lord, we pray that you would lead us in this season to even greater and deeper adoration and worship, and all for Jesus' sake. Amen.